We are reading this long uh, dispute, this debate between savitri and death. And um, death has just felt compelled to give Savitri a boon. Hmm? He has granted to her whatever once the living Satyavan desired in his heart for Savitri. He says he will give her anything except Satyavan. And she said, look into my heart, look into my eyes. If the eyes of darkness can look straight at truth, look in my heart. And knowing what I am, give what thou wilt or what thou must, O death. Nothing I claim but Satyavan alone. So she will not ask for anything. And he looks into her heart and he recognizes what she is and he um, says that he will give her whatever Satyavan wished for her while he was alive. And then he describes what, what it was happy, happy days, unwounded dawns, beautiful, intelligent, courageous daughters, handsome sons, the undisturbed sweetness of union with thy husband, dear and true, and a long life, a long peaceful life in which in... uh, In her home, as she grows older, she will harvest, she will gather in a rich harvest the happiness of being surrounded by all those that she loves and being able to serve those that she loves. So having given her that boon, he expects her to return to the earth. Return, O child, to thy forsaken earth. And what did Savitri reply? If I return without Satyavan, how can your boon come true? Hmm? If you are going to keep my husband, how are all these things going to come true? Hmm? And then death is angry. He sent forth once more his angry cry. What do you know of the uh, life of earth if you think because one man is dead you can't have any happiness and fulfillment? Mm. And uh, you should understand what love is like. Um, Love may possibly be eternal but the objects of love change like waves of a swimmer The swimmer encounters waves in the ocean, so the forms of his love are always changing. So now Savitri is going to reply to him. But Savitri replied to the vague God, Give me back. Satyavan, my only Lord. Thy thoughts are vacant to my soul that feels the deep eternal truth in transient things. Death answered her, Return and try thy soul. Soon shalt thou find appeased that other men on lavish earth have beauty, strength, and truth. And when thou hast half forgotten one of these 
shall wind himself around thy heart. Thy heart that needs some human answering heart against thy breast. For who, being mortal, can dwell glad alone? Then Satyavan shall glide into the past, a gentle memory pushed away from thee by new love and thy children's tender hands, till thou shalt wonder if thou lovest at all. Such is the life earth's travail has conceived a constant stream that never is the same. But Savitri replied to mighty death, O dark, ironic critic of God's work, thou mock the mind and body's faltering search for what the heart holds in a prophet hour and the immortal spirit shall make its own. Mine is a heart that worshipped though forsaken the image of the God its love adored. I have burned in flame to travel in his steps. Are we not they who bore vast solitude seated upon the hills alone with God? Why dost thou vainly strive with me, O death, a mind delivered from all twilight thoughts, to whom the secrets of the gods are plain? For now, at last, I know beyond all doubt the great stars burn with my unceasing fire, and life and death are both its fuel made. Life only was my blind attempt to love. Earth saw my struggle heaven my victory. All shall be seized, transcended. There shall kiss, casting their veils before the marriage fire, the eternal bridegroom and eternal bride. The heavens Accept our broken flights at last. On our life's prow that breaks the waves of time, no signal light of hope has gleamed in vain. She spoke, the boundless members of the God, as if by secret ecstasy assailed, shuddered in silence, as obscurely stir oceans, dim fields delivered to the moon. Then, lifted up as by a sudden wind, around her in that vague and glimmering world, 
the twilight trembled like a bursting veil. Let's try the trick. You go right to the right you go. Give me that set your one, my only love. Tell touch us to reckon to my soul that feels the deep eternal truth in transient Things. Yes. Savitri replied to the vague God. There's something shadowy and unclear about him. No? So she says, the only thing that I am asking is you have to give back Satyavan. I have to be able to take him back to earth with me because he is my only Lord and your thoughts all the things that you are telling me and trying to convince me of they are just empty to my soul which feels the deep eternal truth in transient things The, gr the great eternal truth is not only something distant and high and beyond our reach. It is here and it is in all these passing appearances. And with the soul we can feel that truth even in transient things. Things that are born and pass in time. Behind them there's an eternal truth. Bhuvana. Then answer her. Return and try to answer. Soon shall thou find a peace that other men on lavish earth have beauty, strength, and truth. And when thou hast half forgotten one of these, shall wind himself around the heart that need. Some human answer he found against that breath. For who, being mortal, can well glad alone? Yes. Mm -hmm. she, she, say, she say, calls him ironic, but he's also quite cynical. No? He says, you just go back and try how it is. See. Soon you will find that there are other men like Satyavan who have. The earth is so generous, lavish. She gives lavishly. There's not just one wonderful man. There are other men who have beauty and strength and truth. And after some time, when you've half forgotten Satyapan, one of these other men will wind himself around your heart because the human heart needs love, needs an, other, an answering heart close to the breast because human beings are mortal. They know that they must die and they can't live happily alone. Everybody is looking for a partner, for love, for companionship. Hmm? Martin? Then Satyavan shall glide into the past, a gentle memory pushed away from thee, by new love, and thy children's tender hands, till thou shalt wander if thou at all. Read the next two lines. Such is the life Earth's travail has conceived. A constant stream that never is the same. Yes. So when you meet that other person 
then the memory of Satyavan, it will gently slip away into the past and it will be pushed away even by that new love and the hands of your children, sweet touches of your children. And then uh, when you think of Satyavan, you may wonder whether you ever loved him or not. Mm? Because that's the kind of life that uh, earth nature has given rise to. Earth's travail. We had this word before, no? It means hard work, it means effort, but it specially means the effort of a mother giving birth. So it is here, earth, the earth nature has given birth to a life like this, he says. A constant stream that never is the same. Things go on changing and changing and changing. That's how things are in the earth life. So how will Savitri reply to him, Sarojini? to Savitri reply to mighty death of dark irony critic of God's work. Thou must the mind and bodies glittering faltering faltering such for what the heart holds in a perfect hour and the immortal spirit shall make it all. Yes, what is she saying? She says, you are dark, you have this ironic, skeptical humor, and you are criticizing the work of God. And like many critics, he may not know what he's talking about. She says, you are mocking, you are feeling contempt and disdain for the way that human minds and human bodies are trying to find something. Faltering. Faltering is when you are not sure of what you are doing. Hmm? The mind and the body are searching for something that the heart is holding within it. Something that the heart is sure must happen in the future. For some image of what the heart is holding, it feels sure that a certain fulfillment will come. It sees that in a kind of prophetic vision of the future. No? And she says, and the immortal spirit will make that thing, that fulfillment its own. That means that our longing for love, our search for companionship and all that, it's actually a faltering search for something that will be fulfilled in the future. Yes, one of the Greek philosophers has said this, that life is a river. You may think that you're stepping into the same river, but actually the river is always different. Maybe Buddha also said something like this. Uh, Mila, you read. Man is a part that worship, though forsaken. The image of the God is love a God. I have burned in flame to travel in his steps. I will not today who bore past solitude, seated upon the hills along with God. Mm, thank you. So, who is it that she has worshipped and adored? It is Satyavan, no? Or at least Satyavan is the image of the God she has adored. Earlier she said to, to death, no, if you want me to 
I change my mind, if God wants me to change my mind, he will still have to appear to me in the form of Satyavan. So this heart here, my heart, is a heart that worshipped, even though forsaken, even when uh, Satyavan was taken away from her, went on loving the image of the God, its love adored. And I have followed, I have followed you all this way. I have burned in flame to travel in his steps. She passed through that terrible ordeal in the book of eternal night. And part of that ordeal was this sense of complete loneliness. Are we not they who bore vast solitude, totally alone and abandoned, seated upon the hills, but we were alone with God. That is why we could pass through. Do you see read on? Why dost thou plainly strive with me, O Bhikkhu? Why dost thou plainly strive with me, O A mind delivered from the twilight thoughts, to whom the secrets of the gods are plain. For now, at last, I know beyond all doubt, the great stars burn with the unceasing fire, and life and death are both its fuel made. Hmm. So why are you struggling with me, contradicting me, refusing me? I have, my mind is free from all these twilight thoughts. They are still in the world of twilight, no? He's showing her all these different kinds of twilight. Mm. But uh, my, my mind is free of all those twilight thoughts. I'm not uh, uh, taken in by any of them. The secrets of the gods are plain, absolutely clear to me. Mm. And now I know at last, beyond all doubt, there's no doubt about it. The great stars, all those wonderful suns, are burning with my unceasing fire, the fire of her love. And life and death are both its fuel. They will, neither of them will destroy the love. The love will burn them up. Hmm? Ganga Lakshmi, you can read. Life for me was my blind attempt to love. Hurt so, so, so my struggle, even my victory. All shall be seized. Transcend, they shall kiss, casting their veil before the marriage fire, the eternal bride doom, the eternal bride. Hmm. Mother has commented on these lines in the agenda. Perhaps you remember, and Martin may remember, I don't remember exactly what she has said. She said, uh, life only, that not life and death together, but life only was the attempt to love. Mm -hmm. and now it is the both together, yeah. life and death. Are made it's not true. only life, but both together. Mm. And in this knowledge she sees uh, an assurance that everything all the aspects of life, death, all the aspects of existence will be seized by this higher reality, transcended. And it will be like a marriage ceremony. In the Hindu marriage ceremony, the fire is the witness. And the, the bridegroom and the bride remove their veils in front of the fire. 
we can think about who is the bridegroom and who is the bride. Transcendent means when we go beyond all the appearances to the eternal and infinite reality. All the limitations and yeah, false appearances. Uday will read the next three lines. These are three of my favorite lines in the whole poem. You read them beautifully. <laughs> in heavens I accept our broken flights at last, on our life form that breaks the waves of time, no single light of hope has gleamed in vain. Mm. So we are like birds trying to fly, but we don't, we can't reach, <laughs> we can't fulfill our flights, just like our search is a faltering search. Our flights are broken. They don't succeed. But nevertheless, the aspiration and the wish that made us want to fly the higher levels of consciousness, accept it. Our life is like a ship that's on a journey. It's on a journey the prow is the front part of the ship and it's passing through the waves of time. We, our lives move through time and he, on the prow of the ship there's a signal light. In several of Huta's paintings mother has made her part paint the prow of the ship with the golden light. You know. That's what's leading us forward. So on our life's prow that breaks the waves of time, no signal light of hope has gleamed in vain. Even if it's only a tiny little hope, it won't have gleamed in vain. It will be fulfilled. Okay. She spoke, the boundless members of the God, as if by secret ecstasy assailed, shuddered in silence, as obscure stir oceans in fields, delivered to the moon. You can read the next sentence too. Then lift up, as by a sudden wind, around her in that vague and glimmering world, the twilight trembled <coughs> like a burst of Mm. So these powerful words which she has spoken here, these words that the mother has commented on, seems to have an effect upon death himself. It's as if some shudder of ecstasy passes through this whole vast dark body or this body of darkness as if he's attacked by some secret ecstasy and Sri says that shuddering it is like the wind uh, the, the ocean stirring beneath the moon the movement uh, the, the ocean is attracted by the moon it moves now and the, not only death seems to be affected, something changes in that twilight world. It's as if a, there's a wind and that fog of half darkness that they were in. It, um, it trembles as if it's about to, to burst and to be torn. You know? So something in that vague and glimmering twilight world. The whole atmosphere changes. Nihon. Thus, with on the speech, the great opponents strove. Around those splits, 
in the glittering mist, a deepening half-light fled with the pearly winds, as if to reach some far ideal morn. Mm. Yes, we are in the, the morning twilight, you remember? The dream twilight of the ideal. So they are having this dispute with armed speech. They express themselves. They try to prevail. And now with these powerful words of Savitri, there's this change. The, the mist seems to glitter with light and the half light becomes deeper, more light and it's moving swiftly forwards as if with pearly wings, as if it's moving towards some wonderful morning, some ideal morning. as if there will be some great fulfillment. Joel. Outline her thoughts flew through the gleaming haze, mingling the bright pinion with its lights and veils, and all her words like dazzling jewels were caught into the glow of a mysterious world, or tricked in the rainbow shifting of its hues, like echoes swung fainting in too far sound. Mm. A wonderful, subtle picture of the atmosphere of that twilight of the ideal. It's as if her thoughts take form and they fly like birds through, through that gleaming haze, that golden mist. Um, pinions are wings. So they are wings, they have bright wings and they are those thoughts of savitri are mingling, moving around in the lights and veils of that world. And her words are caught like dazzling jewels, brightly shining gemstones. They are caught into the glow of a mysterious world. Hmm. Beautiful poetic picture. Uh, picture. Uh, in the early morning before dawn, sometimes there are droplets of dew and if some light comes, then they shine with rainbow colors. It's as if her words get uh, uh, materialized like that in that subtle world. Or it says tricked. Here this means dressed up. in the rainbow shifting of its hues, the colors, the rainbow colors of that world are changing. No? Her words get uh, clothed with those colors or with its sounds. They are like echoes, faint echoes of her words, swam, fainting, getting fainter, and fainter and fainter into the distance as they fade away. Will you read? Yes. All utterance, all mood must there become an unenduring tissue soon by mind to make a gossamer rope of beautiful change. Yes. For well, everything that is uttered in that world, everything that's spoken there, or even everything that is felt, all mood, your mood may change from this to that. There, in that twilight ideal world, there it must become 
something that does not last, an unenduring tissue sown by mind, as if it is a fabric that the mind weaves and creates hmm, to make a gossamer robe of beautiful change. Does anybody know this word gossamer? The spider's webs, yes. Hmm? Hmm? Spider's webs, the silk of spiders, and especially the, the young spiders, when they hatch out of their eggs, they, they spin a long thread of silk and they sail away on that. They fly away on that. And uh, of course it looks very, very, very fine. It reflects the light. It's something incredibly fine. But actually it's very strong. And I think I told you that uh, in, a, in a, an old cathedral in England, I saw a painting that had been made on cloth woven from gossamer, from spider's webs, a painting of the Virgin Mary. So it has a beautiful name in French. What is the name of gossamer in French? Fil de Vierge. Or Fil de la Vierge. Fil de la Vierge. Yeah? Yes? No? I'm right? Yes. Mm. So a gossamer robe, a beautiful change, something that's always changing. That's the thing about the ideal. It's not enduring, it's not permanent, it's very alluring and beautiful, but it doesn't get realized, it doesn't get manifested. Hmm? Um, bomb. In hand of Hunter Simons, where she walked, on the dim grass of vapor on the earth frame, a floating veil of vision in her form, a flaring rope of wind behind her feet. Yes. So she's focusing on her silent will, her will that Satyavan should be returned to earth and life. She is walking through this twilight world on the dim grass of vague, unreal plains. And there's as if a floating robe, a veil of visions going in front of her and a trailing robe of dreams following behind her as she moves through that world. Dawn. But now her spirit's flame of conscient force, retiring from a sweetness without fruit, called back her thoughts from speech to sit within in a deep room in meditation's house. Yes. So she's moving through this world of dream, but she herself becomes more and more concentrated. Her spirit's flame of conscient force draws back from the sweetness and beauty of that world because it doesn't give any fruit. She calls back her thoughts. She's not going to say anything more. She's concentrating within, in a deep room in meditation's house, deep within herself. Uh, Praveen, would you read? For only there could dwell the soul's firm truth, imperishable, the tongue of sacrifice. It flamed unquenched upon the central heart, where burns for the high house lord and his mate, the homestead's sentinel and witness fire, 
from which the altars of the gods are lifted. Yes. So it's only deep within, in meditation's house, that only there could dwell firm, the soul's firm truth, the imperishable truth. It burns there like a tongue, like a flamey tongue of sacrifice, of offering. It flamed unquenched. It can't be put out. To quench a fire, you pour water on it. Or, no. This fire cannot be quenched. And this, it's burning on the central half. The, the fire altar in the very center of her being. No. And that is burning for the high house lord and his mate. It's an image of the of a feudal household with the Lord and his queen and uh, always that fire is burning before them. But these are the two aspects of the divine, the eternal bridegroom and the eternal bride. So the altars of the gods are lit from that flame, that uh, fire of the homestead, of the, the central home. This fire is the sentinel, sentinel, the guard, the guardian, and the witness. Gumsun. Why? In, she's realized that in that world everything is beautiful and suggestive but it's all fleeting it's not going to be realized she can express her knowledge there she's done that and something has changed in that world but um, now she's just concentrating on the realization of her will all still compelled went gliding on unchanging. Still was the order of these words reversed. From mortal land, the heart and spirit obeyed. And she behind was leader, leader of their march. And they in front were followers of her way. Yes. So something is compelling everything to just go on, gliding on, unchanged in that twilight world. And Sri Aurobindo says, still was the order of these worlds reversed. It's as if things are back to front. Because Savitri is leading, the mortal led, and behind her, are the God and the spirit of Satyavan. They are following her. Hmm? She's, she's behind them, but she's compelling them to go forward. She behind was leader of their march. And they were in front, were followers of her will. So I think it's like that. I think Satyavan is going first. And behind him is death. There was a description about how Satyavan was like a sheep and he's like the shepherd behind and Savitri is following them. But he says it's all was compelled. So she's the one who started moving forward and um, her movement is leading their march. They in front were followers of her will. She wants to move on out of this twilight world into some fulfillment. Chandra. One more day, journey through the disturbing place, making companions companion. companion by the primary place. But closer the earthly as if perturbed. Per, per, 
The E is silent. We have to say it as if there's no E between the B and the B. As if perturbed. Yes. Okay. Yes. So they are journeying onwards through the drifting ways, those glimmering mists, they are vaguely companioning them, accompanying them. Hmm? But Sri Aurobindo says now things are moving faster, as if in some way the atmosphere of that world is troubled, as if it wants to escape. It's such a misty twilight world, as if it wants to escape from the clearness of Savitri's soul. And then there's a beautiful description uh, of, her, of her soul. You will read, please, dear. Hmm? Will you read? Yes. A heaven bird upon dry wings of wind, a bird like a colored and embodied and fire, by spirit carrying in a tree how cute head, and through the enchanted dimness move her soul. Yes. So this is the image of her soul as it's moving, like a heaven bird with jeweled wings of wind, as if it's being carried by spirits, carrying this lovely bird with its wings of wind, carried by spirits in a cave that's like a pearl. Mm -hmm. She's being carried as if those spirits are carrying her soul like a fire and they are carrying it very close to them so that uh, the fire shouldn't be uh, attacked in any way. Mm -hmm. A heaven bird upon jeweled wings of wind, born means carried like a colored and embosomed fire by spirits carried in a pearl hued cave on through the enchanted dimness moved her soul. <coughs> so someday when a great artist takes up this poem to turn it into film uh, they will be able to make a beautiful picture of Savitri's soul being carried by the spirits like this jeweled bird of fire Bebel then sport in front of her and Satyavan in the dark front of death, a failing star, a boat was the unseen words of his fate. Yes. Death is in front of her, and Satyavan is in the front of death, in the dark front of death, and he's looking like a star which is about to go out. No? And above, is the unseen balance of his fate. We don't know what is going to happen, which way it will go. Of his fate means death's fate. No, of Satyavan's fate. And this failing star also Satyavan. Yes, yes, Satyavan's looking faint like a failing star. So here it's changing. In the previous then the mortal led the God and the spirit. He, Sri Aurobindo says he led, she led, yes. but then he says that she was leading from behind. Mm -hmm. And she behind mm -hmm. was leader of their march. And they in front were followers of her will. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's how it is. She's at the back. Death walked in front of her. And Satyavan, in front of death, is also walking like a failing star. Yeah, we can't be lazy when we are reading. <laughs> we have to carefully. But, uh, Satyavan is in the subtle physical. Yes, they are all in the subtle physical. Yeah. Savitri has left her body, no? Her body is lying there on the forest floor. They are all in the subtle physical. Shall we read a little bit? But Savitri replied to the vague God, Give me back, Satyavan, my only Lord. Thy thoughts are vacant to my soul that feels the deep eternal truth in transient things. Death answered her, Return and try thy soul. Soon shalt thou find appeased that other men on lavish earth have beauty, strength, and truth. And when thou hast half forgotten, one of these shall wind himself around thy heart that needs some human answering heart against thy breast. For who, being mortal, can dwell glad alone? Then Satyavan shall glide into the past, a gentle memory pushed away from thee by new love and thy children's tender hands, till thou shalt wonder if thou lovest at all. Such is the life earth's travail has conceived, a constant stream that never is the same. But Savitri replied to mighty death, O dark, ironic critic of God's work, thou mockst the mind and body's faltering search for what the heart holds in a prophet hour and the immortal spirit shall make its own. Mine is a heart that worshipped, though forsaken, the image of the God its love adored. I have burned in flame to travel in his steps. Are we not they who bore vast solitude? Seated upon the hills alone with God? Why dost thou vainly strive with me, O death? A mind delivered from all twilight thoughts To whom the secrets of the gods are plain. For now at last I know beyond all doubt The great stars burn with my unceasing fire And life and death are both its fuel made Life 
only was my blind attempt to love. Earth saw my struggle, heaven my victory. All shall be seized, transcended. There shall kiss, casting their veils before the marriage fire, the eternal bridegroom and eternal bride. The heavens accept our broken flight at last on our life's prow that breaks the waves of time no signal light of hope has gleamed in vain she spoke the boundless members of the God as if by secret ecstasy assailed, shuddered in silence, as obscurely stir ocean's dim fields delivered to the moon. Then lifted up as by a sudden wind, Around her in that vague and glimmering world The twilight trembled like a bursting veil Thus with armed speech the great opponents strove Around those spirits in the glittering mist A deepening half-light fled with pearly wings As if to reach some far ideal morn Outlined her thoughts flew through the gleaming haze Mingling bright pinioned with its lights and veils, and all her words like dazzling jewels were caught into the glow of a mysterious world, or tricked in the rainbow shifting of its hues like echoes swam fainting into far sound. All utterance, all mood, must there become an unenduring tissue sewn by mind to make a gossamer robe of beautiful change. Intent upon her silent will she walked, on the dim grass of vague, unreal plains, a floating veil of visions in her front, a trailing robe of dreams behind her feet. But now her spirit's flame of conscient force Retiring from a sweetness without fruit, Called back her thoughts from speech, To sit within in a deep room in meditation's house. For only there could dwell the soul's firm truth. Imperishable, a tongue of sacrifice, it flamed unquenched upon the central hearth, where burns for the high house lord and his mate 
the homestead sentinel and witness fire from which the altars of the gods are lit. All still compelled went gliding on unchanged. Still was the order of these worlds reversed. The mortal led, the god and spirit obeyed. And she behind was leader of their march, And they in front were followers of her will. Onward they journeyed through the drifting ways, Vaguely companioned by the glimmering mists. But faster now all fled, as if perturbed, escaping from the clearness of her soul. A heaven bird upon jeweled wings of wind, born like a coloured and embosomed fire by spirits carried in a pearl-hued cave, on through the enchanted dimness moved her soul. Death walked in front of her, and Satyavan in the dark front of death, a failing star. Above, was the unseen balance of his fate.